and one on Wednesday. Um, those went really well. Uh, we had a good turnout. Um, and um, the local farmer that you all met, um, well, my dad, um, yeah, really enjoyed it. And uh, sort of, you know, what a bright bunch you are. And um, yeah, you just sort of really enjoyed the interaction and uh, getting to sort of talk about his job and some of the challenges that he faces um, growing crops um, in a way that's sort of safe and um, risk free, if you like, or, or um, is uh, risky in a, a minimal way. Uh, yeah, so it's sort of nice to him for him to sort of talk to you guys about that. He doesn't get the opportunity to, to do that much. And, um, you know, lots of farmers are very enthusiastic about their jobs. So it's, it's great to sort of, uh, for them to be able to interact with the general public and uh, talk about some of the challenges that they face uh, trying to grow crops safely in the countryside. Um, yeah, so thanks for coming along and thanks for um, sort of your comments and your, your uh, questions for, for my dad, he, he really enjoyed it. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, green crime uh, part two. So in this session, the last session was called uh, growing, or I termed it growing crimes, and it, uh, what we focused on then uh, was sort of uh, crimes related to the growing of food and uh, and um, um, other things, you know, cotton for fabrics, if you like. Um, and in this session, we're going to look at um, waste crimes. So um, yeah, last week was growing. Uh, oh, sorry, last session was growing, and this session is sort of waste um, in, our, in our focus on the types of crimes that we'll be looking at. Um, the structure of today's session. So we'll have a, a recap, or just a really quick recap on the sort of definition of green crime. Um, you know, to sort of focus on our minds on what we're looking at, um, and then um, actually we'll ignore number two, environmental harm. That was on last week's uh, seminar. We'll, we'll uh, do number three and number four. So um, causes, um, we'll look at a theory of capitalism and waste um, and then another theory called risk society. Um, and then we'll have a couple of examples. Um, we'll talk about the planetary boundaries, um, UK waste disposal. Um, and then what we touched on actually in, uh, when we visited our farms, um, this uh, sort of thing called fly tipping. Um, and then we'll have a bit of a recap, uh, conclusion and question time at the end. Um, it's a bit shorter um, this session than Monday's session. Um, so we might finish um, a bit a bit sooner, um, but I, I haven't done it. I haven't rehearsed it, so um, I'll have to see how it goes. OK, so, yeah, like I said last uh, or last lecture, don't be put off by this diagram. Um, I, I, you, you won't need to use this in any of your work. Um, it's, this is more of a reference point really for myself more than anyone. Um, but this is called the product chain um, and it was designed by a guy called Huber. Um, and it sort of it, um, gives a diagrammatic representation, if you like, of the different stages that products go through um, from, uh, for, what do they call it, from farm to fork, if you like. So, um, so and it, it, this is not necessarily just in farming. This can be in any um, industry. Um, normally what happens is in, in nature, raw materials are extracted. Uh, those materials are processed. Um, products um, are sort of, um, or first stage products are produced and then end products are produced. Those products are then use, used and consumed, um, and some of the uh, material is recycled um, into the uh, materials processing part. Um, and then the end stage is normally uh, the sort of treatment of waste, um, um, which we're gonna focus to uh, sort of the latter stage of the production cycle. Um, so, yeah, what happens to the waste after we've sort of consumed the products um, that have been manufactured and produced? Um, so, yeah, Monday's uh, lecture was on the growing crimes or the upstream stage of production. And today's uh, lecture is going to be focused on uh, waste crimes. So the downstream stages of uh, production, the flow of production. Um, so yeah, just a recap. So how do we define uh, green crime? 
if you haven't watched Monday's lecture, there was a, a, a range of different definitions, and there are in the reading that I've attached uh, for this week's um, uh, reading materials. Um, but this is the sort of um, definition we settled on, if you like, um, on Monday's lecture, um, and that is that defines green crime as acts that cause or have the potential to cause significant harm to ecological systems for the purpose of increasing and uh, or supporting production. Um, so yeah, we're not interested in sort of harm to people or harm to animals um, in green crime. We're looking uh, specifically at harm to ecological systems. Now that can have a sort of impact on people as well. Um, and as we saw in our, our farm visit, uh, with sort of chemical runoffs in streams uh, that can contaminate uh, drinking water um, and which can sort of harm people. So uh, sometimes there is a sort of link uh, between ecological harm and or environmental harm and sort of social harm. Um, or it can just be, you know, sort of um, damage to um, forests or damage to fields, um, which is um, upsetting and, and difficult to see. Um, so, yeah, the, we're considering uh, those sorts of crimes when we're studying green crime. Um, good morning, Ziri. Good to, good to have you along. Um, OK, so if I'm also if I'm going through my uh, lecture, please, you know, feel free to type any questions, uh, any comments. Um, give me a thumbs up if, you know, if I say something you like or whatever, you know, in the comments box, uh, feel free to use that. Um, yeah, um, so the reason I settled on this definition of green crime is I like the sort of uh, emphasis on production and a lot of sociologists um, like Karl Marx are really concerned about the uh, link between green crime and production processes. Um, however, one problem with this sort of uh, definition of green crime is it doesn't sort of say much about um, waste. Uh, so we're, we're talking here about um, um, uh, it's sort of implied, I guess, but um, what, what we're focusing on today is not just production, but also um, end production, what happens after production happens. So, um, and that's when a lot of waste actually occurs. Um, so, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that a bit more. Um, so, yeah, a bit of, so part two, a little bit about theory. Um, we discussed this in Monday's uh, lecture, so um, I'm just recapping on this. If you missed it, um, um, yeah, there's a bit of an introduction to this idea. Um, so this is uh, Karl Marx's theory of um, the circuit of capital. Um, and this is the idea that um, business owners or business people, capitalists, um, invest money into um, uh, labor power, so people's working capacities and um, raw materials or, or and the means of production, so the things that are going to make it possible to produce a product. Um, so the next stage of the cycle, um, a product is produced. Um, I've got a sort of uh, a fork here uh, by the P for production. Um, and then um, after these products are produced, um, they're put in markets um, to sell, um, commodity markets. Um, so supermarket is a good example. Um, you know, if you go into uh, a supermarket, you just don't find one product on the shelf. Normally they're stacked with competing products um, on the supermarket shelves. And, and Karl Marx spoke about there being a sort of a, a fetishism or a sort of like a magic aura that um, products have when they're sort of lined up next to each other on shelves. Um, and you, you sort of uh, you get that sort of uh, supermarket buzz sometimes when you walk in through and that's, that's what he's sort of talking about the marketplace being quite an ex exciting sort of buzzing uh, uh, thing where lots of different products are placed uh, side by side um, and after a product is sold at the supermarket um, some amount of money goes uh, back into the um, production cycle um, or the, the capitalists invest a certain amount of that money back into the production cycle. Um, but then also they sort of cream off the profits, if you like. And um, there's a sort of surplus amount of money that's um, made during this uh, cycle um, that they uh, take for themselves um, and, you know, spend on whatever. Um, and that is a greater sort of uh, share of wealth. Um, than the money paid to the workers in the first stage of the cycle who 
um, don't receive a sort of um, a, a fair share, Marx would say, and are sort of exploited as a, as a result of this sort of um, unfair exchange. Um, okay, so this is sort of like Karl Marx um, writing about capitalism um, in the 1900s um, during the Industrial Revolution. Um, and as we pointed out on Monday's lecture, you know, times have changed since then. Um, in, interestingly, I, I spoke when I did my research to lots of farmers about this sort of um, formula uh, for uh, business and a lot of them got it. They were just, you know, this sort of common sense to many business people. This is how businesses tend to operate. So uh, Marx was, you know, on the ball, if you like, um, and coming from a sort of business family, he probably uh, had a bit of insight there. Um, Okay, so, um, and this is another recap on Monday's lecture, so just to keep you up to speed. So, um, th um, the argument is that um, capitalism has sort of evolved and expanded from um, the Industrial Revolution and, and, um, and before, uh, and in this day and age, we live in an era of sort of global, late modern uh, or global capitalism um, and sort of global economies. Um, more, more often than not, you don't actually hear uh, sort of sociologists or criminologists in this day and age talking necessarily about capitalism. Um, a lot um, more of the sort of conversation and discussion tends to be about neoliberalism. Um, and this is, this is the concept on one hand of capitalism, which still sort of happens and exists and, um, you know, affects all of us in, in our everyday lives. Um, but on the other hand, there's um, sort of the regulation of trade, um, which is another um, aspect of, of modern life. Um, and hopefully um, through our seminar work this week and sort of going on a farm visit, uh, a lot of you were to, um, able to hear a sort of local farm, farmer talking about the national um, um, rules and laws that apply to agriculture. So. Um, farmers aren't just free to to make money as they like from the countryside. They have to comply with lots of rules, um, and and people call this um, sort of regulatory capitalism, um, and that's a sort of aspect of neoliberalism. So um, neoliberalism um, can be interpreted as sort of new freedom, and that tends to be the the idea that politicians push um, is that you know if you vote for our party, we'll deregulate markets, um, you'll be able to, you know, um, um, make money without sort of interference from the government, um, or you won't receive, you know, inspections from departments of the government, you can, you know, vote for us, we'll get rid of this bureaucracy and all this paperwork, and you'll be able to, um, you know, boost business that way. Um, however, um, in an era of neoliberal um, the era of neo neoliberalism and this idea of new free freedom is also the golden era of regulation. Um, so, um, yeah, I, the ideology of neoliberalism promotes this idea of deregulation and less paperwork and less bureaucracy. But in practice, um, under the conditions of neoliberalism, new uh, a new regulatory regime appears to have, have expanded and extended. Um, so the new regulatory order is referred uh, by some as regulatory capitalism. And you could say this is the sort of regulation is an aspect of neoliberalism. Um, so regulatory capitalism and neoliberalism. So, yeah, on the one hand, this idea in, in the UK, um, you know, during uh, lockdown, Boris Johnson's response was, you know, let's build, build, build this, you know, um, so we're still sort of pitching this idea of boosting the economy and, and doing free trade deals uh, with countries around the world. Um, but for many of us, lockdown was the most sort of uh, restrictive and um, repressive stage of um, um, well, experience. You know, um, it, it certainly was in my life. I've never experienced anything like that. And, you know, for, for uh, many of my, um, older people, you know, haven't been through um such a stage of sort of government control. So, um, yeah, social distancing, wearing masks, um, two meter distancing, um, and sort of limitations on families getting together at Christmas, you know, is a key, you know, or is, is government control and regulation. So, um, tight um, policing uh, powers given to the police as well. 
Um, and um, yeah, like I say, uh, lots of laws affecting business um, and environmental law that sort of really affects the way uh, farmers interact with nature. Um, and just, gen you know, most businesses use materials that have been taken from nature. So, so that sort of environmental law will impact most businesses, whether they're, you know, selling meat or uh, cotton products. Um, all of these products are grown in nature. So to, um, to some extent or another, you know, environmental law will have an impact on almost all businesses. Um, okay or businesses or concerned with production rather than services if you like um so yeah so, so um uh had a recap on this idea that of marx this theory of the uh, accumulation of capital or the circuits of capital um and there's this guy uh, murphy who's uh, another environmental sociologist and he came along and uh, said yeah you know it's really good that um you know this theory that Marx has and lots of sociologists are using it to sort of talk about the way that capitalism um, extracts resources from natural environments however um, what Marx overlooked is the production of waste and he sort of suggests that this same cycle is also a cycle um, that explains the way in which uh, waste is produced so I'll just read the quote here. So um, the foundation of Marx's model is the idea that raw materials are transformed into commodities. And this would seem to be the most acceptable and widely shared aspect of um, this idea. But something is missing. Uh, waste in the production process is ignored. The model is constructed as if raw materials were transformed into commodities uh, with perfect efficiency. Um, but this, in fact, never occurs. Process um, of production um, always operated at less than 100% efficiency. Um, it is not only sellable commodities that are produced in the process of production, uh, but waste is also produced. Um, so yeah, as, as capitalists or invest money into um, raw materials and uh, people's labour power or, or the workforce, and products are produced um, which are then sold as commodities uh, we buy these commodities you know on, on supermarket shelves or um, you know cars in uh, drive them home from four courts um, but eventually those cars will need scrapping or um, you know uh, disposing of and you know we'll take those food items home we'll unwrap them um, and we'll eat them and they'll either be food waste or sort of um, plastic waste uh, that's um, the result of us unwrapping these products that we bought um, or these commodities that we bought at the supermarket. Um, so it's a good sort of observation that um, in capitalist uh, trade, um, waste is always being uh, accumulated as much as wealth is being uh, uh, accumulated as well. Um, so, so yeah, sort of key observation. Um, so the accumulation of capital uh, ties in uh, with the accumulation of waste. And I've got sort of a, a picture of some um, pipes or pumping out um, industrial waste from a factory into to a local uh, river. Um, you know, this in this day and age is unthinkable. Um, you know, waste is sort of treated it, um, in different ways. But um, in Marx's era, especially, you know, waste people tended to lack any consideration to what was being sort of dumped into rivers or um, uh, pumped into the environment. So um, we're becoming a lot more aware of, of waste. Um, and this would be a key example of this. So um, um, there's been quite a few, actually it's quite interesting just before lockdown and actually during lockdown as well. So this is an article published in uh, 2020. So. Um, this is about the UK shipping plastic um, waste to poorer countries, despite um, the Conservatives' promises that they would sort of uh, uh, clean up their act, if you like. So um, um, if there's a link here if you want to read any more about this, but this is a sort of ongoing problem. Um, the UK, you know, which is sort of leading capitalist economy. Um, uh, disposing of waste um, by shipping it off in boats, huge vessels around the world um, to poorer countries to sort of um, to deal with. Um, so we're sort of um, 
um, yeah, sort of shipping our, our waste overseas to have other people sort of deal with it. So um, we'll, we'll come back to this, um, but it's a, um, an example that we'll, we'll discuss towards the end. Um, okay, and just another little bit of theory. So we sort of talked about uh, global capitalism um, and neoliberalism and the rise of this sort of, um, um, yeah, the, the expansion growth of capitalism around the world, um, which has been a, a key part of globalization. Um, and at the same time, um, the world not just being a place of sort of free trade where people can uh, sort of go outside and chop down a tree and make a, a table as they might have done in, in the old days. Um, you, you know, the trees and countryside environments, um, animals are all sort of protected by law. Um, and often in these days you need sort of qualifications or certificates um, um, and you need to be able to uh, talk to uh, government departments to make sure that your trade is acting and operating um, um, according to certain set guidelines or, or uh, policies or um, legislation, um, you know, as part of your business operation. So um, businesses aren't just, yeah, sort of extracting natural resources without concern, as would have been the case maybe 100 or 150, 200 years ago um, in England in modern, during the times of sort of modern capitalism. Um, so this guy uh, is a key sort of theorist in this area um, and he's called Eurek Beck and sadly died uh, back in uh, 2015 while I was doing my PhD and it was sort of a bit of a blow to um, the community if you like. He was a very well respected uh, kind man. If you listen to his uh, uh, lectures online he's got a very sort of soft uh, and sympathetic way about him but and he was uh, very well respected. Um, and he wrote this book called Risk Society that isn't too difficult to read. It's quite a short book, um, but it's quite a novel idea. And he drew um, lots of people's attention to this new form, this new culture that many people have become accustomed to and didn't realize that they had. Um, and Risk Society sort of um, uh, illuminates um, um, this idea of a society based around or, or concerned with risks and uh, many of them um, are being sort of invisible risks or, or sometimes even sort of make-believe risks um, and yeah it's sort of credited as a sort of key theorist here. Um, there's a quote here I'll sort of I'll read for it briefly and give a couple of examples while I'm doing so but uh, and, and this um, you'll be able to find this quote in Tim Newburn's uh, reading for this week as well. Um, so uh, for Beck, he's, he says that uh, the gain in power uh, from techno slash economic progress um, is being increasingly overshadowed um, by the production of risks. Um, so, you know, this idea of progress, so modern societies progressively um, 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 improving. Um, so if you're a positivist, you know, you sort of believe that through science and through the development of new technologies and new medicines, um, the world is becoming a better place, if you like, and, and that is progressive. However, um, while this is happening, also there's this sort of, there's this project, production and generation of risks as well, and this growing awareness of uh, um, worrying um, and uncertain things, if you like, that concern us all. Um, our lives are sort of uh, affected by these risks, as we'll see as we go on. Um, so at the centre lie uh, the risks and consequences of modernisation, um, which are revealed as irreversible threats to uh, the life of planets, uh, animals and human beings. Um, so, you know, if we think of sort of new modern technologies, um, some of them can be um, uh, really sort of positive life altering things, sort of advances in uh, medicine, pastur uh, pasteurization, sort of being able to like pasteurize milk um, or um, sort of treatments for illnesses, um, um, surgery, um, you know, there's lots of um, amazing uh, new technologies out there that help humans to live longer and happier lives. Um, however, 
Um, there's also sort of the development of things like nuclear bombs, um, nuclear power, um, surveillance technologies, uh, social media, um, and these and, and sort of chemicals um, that are used in in production and manufacturing and um, that come with sort of worrying side effects um, or, or worrying risks. Um, so we're sort of um, aware of these sort of uh, these um, risks as part of our, our modern existence. Um, I'll give you some examples in a moment, but uh, this is sort of the raw theory, if you like. Um, so. Um, yeah, unlike the factory related or occupational hazards of the 19th century and first half of the 20th, uh, these can no longer be limited to uh, certain localities or groups, um, but rather exhibit a tendency to globalization, uh, which spans production and reproduction as much as national borders. And in this sense, uh, brings into being supranational or non specific uh, global hazards. Uh, with a new type of social and political dynamism. Um, so the biggest sort of example here, I guess, uh, uh, would be uh, coronavirus. Um, so we all, in the global community, in this global world, we're all sort of hyper aware that, um, that um, coronavirus uh, began in these sort of wet meat markets in Shanghai, in China, and spread across the world. Um, we were watching news reports of how it affected people in New York um, and then Italy um, and then also you know within our own sort of nation um, so although we're individual countries we're sort of linked um, together with our sort of worry and our concern um, about uh, coronavirus um, also the current sort of war in in uh, Ukraine um, we have all sort of well not all countries of the world but um, a lot of countries of the world have sort of connected together and linked up and we take this on as a sort of a, a global challenge if you like to um uh to sort of tackle the problem of war in ukraine um perhaps more countries could get involved in that but um, um hopefully you'll get this idea that it's, it's not just a sort of national british um 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 problem it's, it's now a sort of global problem and and this awareness that sort of harm caused in ukraine um will have global consequences so um food prices are skyrocketing as a result of um, um this war in ukraine so we're sort of aware of the effects that it has on our on our economy and the, and the price of uh, a loaf of bread at the local supermarket so um yeah our awareness as individuals um is a lot more sort of global uh, we're, we're no longer sort of local people we have this sort of um, new outlook about uh, the world and the sort of hazards that are in the world and that is that sort of mindset that way of thinking um, is a tendency of globalization um, yeah so yeah we're not no, no longer concerned about people losing their lives down at the local factory uh, we're concerned about that as well as uh, these sort of global risks and problems that uh that uh, um yeah could impact on us all asteroids that's a sort of <laughs> another one i saw a fantastic film uh, the other day about uh, um you know an in imminent asteroid uh, collision and uh, um you know the, the whole world is going to be affected by this uh, this global problem um okay and so um an example here what we might consider um to illustrate beck's theory of risk society um is weed killers in in the back garden uh, so your family um may or may not if you've got a back garden um and at home um you some families you know use chemicals in the back garden uh, mow the lawns um and some families don't we, I, I live next door to next door neighbors who are um um, are very angry if if other neighbours use chemicals in the garden and they want their garden uh, space to be sort of free from chemicals and, and a bit more natural in that respect. Um, so using uh, weed killers or pest sprays in, in gardens um, should, you know, sort of encourage stronger and healthier uh, grass lawns, fruit and vegetables. Um, my dad's a sort of, um, you know, he for him and I guess his generation, you know, these 
chemicals that people use in um, their gardens are sort of the feet of uh, science. You know, this is like the best science we've got. You know, is it kills weeds effectively, uh, kills bugs effectively. Um, you know, this is sort of this is the reason people go to university and study plant sciences, develop these sorts of sciences. So why not use them? Why not be proud of them? Um, the problem is, uh, for many other people, these chemicals come with hazards such as uh, being poisonous to humans. Um, uh, so we, we had an instance the other day in our back sort of shared uh, garden community, if you like, that uh, someone had been using uh, pesticides in the in the garden areas um, and this woman's child had been sort of playing in that area and she was really worried for her child's safety. Um, um, Anyway, um, so um, using pest sprays and weed killers in your gardens um, from this point of view um, is, is a risk to biological diversity, uh, particularly bees. A lot of people have a, a real concern about the use of insect uh, repellents and killers um, and how that might affect uh, populations of bees. Um, and no mow may, this is a, a thing nowadays in the US um, and in, in England, uh, where people are encouraged uh, not to mow their lawns during the month of May um, to um, yeah encourage more uh, insect um, species, especially pollinating species such as bees um, who can sort of um, uh, fly from plant to plant, um, making sure they're pollinated and, and um, that should encourage a sort of healthier um, environment, if you like. Um, so in many ways, no mo may um, is sort of almost going back to pre-modern methods of, of uh, gardening. Um, you know, we've got these uh, chemicals uh, that we can use in gardens. However, the risks of using these chemicals um, has a sort of uh, an impact on the way that we use them or not use them. Um, some people are sort of going back to sort of uh, traditional or um, uh, pre-modern methods as a way of coping with um, the risks associated with modern science um, and that risk is uh, exactly what um, Beck, uh, Beck is, is writing about. Um, uh, so no other examples of risks actually um, so Tim Newburn on risk um, he says that advances, advances in knowledge and the creation of new technologies uh, that we once uh, used to assume were the key to managing and improving our health, also a frequent source of very considerable threat. Where we, okay, um, we are producing risks that are potentially devastating. Um, and he sort of uh, distinguishes here uh, two types of risks. So you have like um, external risks. Um, so in traditional societies, uh, these external risks, um, so outside of the individual human, um, were associated with nature. Um, so in, since the beginning of time, there's always been infectious diseases. You can read about those in the Bible. Um, poor harvests, you know, plagues of locusts, um, floods, etc. You know, the, these risks and hazards have always been there in nature. Um, however, in this day and age, yeah, we have these sort of manufactured risks um, and these are created uh, by the impact of our developing knowledge on the world around us. So uh, the, the risks of using agrochemicals, which my dad was talking about the other day in our seminars, um, or the risks of uh, driving cars and, um, you know, lead pollution in the atmosphere. Um, the risks of going on a, a, a journey and a flight to Tenerife for a holiday and the impact that will have, you know, on the global environment. Your global footprint um, is a sort of an example of, of um, a risk associated uh, with manufacturing, so a manufactured risk. Um, Extinction Rebellion, um, uh, of taking to the streets and increasing our awareness of um, manufactured risks. So, so risks caused by modern industry uh, to the, the global environment. Um, and I've got a photograph here, so herbal remedies and, um, you know, people in this, you know, I've got next door neighbours who would much rather pay um, uh, triple the amount to go to an acupuncture 
go and have acupuncture as a treatment for their illness and then they would to take you know tablets and pills um, from pharmaceutical companies um, so those tablets and pills should be the sort of the, the the best thing that science and progress can offer um, yet they're sort of reverting to these pre-modern methods for um, uh, curing pain or, or illnesses um, and the G5 movement I think is a really good example as well of this sort of this invisible risk, um, this sort of fear that they have and this high anxiety, that these new technologies, again, that should sort of improve the well-being of many people around the world um, are going to have these negative uh, impacts such as, uh, you know, such as cancer or, or um, brain problems or um, um, or the militarization of, of sort of uh, people and natural environments. Um, yeah, you know, and people are worried and concerned about these risks um, or change and act and uh, behave in different ways, as well as sort of uh, protest and demonstrate and take to the streets. Um, yeah, so, you know, Beck's on the ball here. This is a good sort of theory. Um, um, so, yeah, on the one hand, just a recap, we've discussed sort of Marx's accumulation of capital um, on capitalism and how that links to the accumulation of waste. So as much as people make profit out of business, um, they also generate pro, uh, you know, waste through those processes. And capitalism obviously being linked to neoliberalism and, and regulatory capitalism. Um, and then the, um, off the back of that, um, in Tim Newburn's work as well, um, it, it, uh, there's this discussion of risk society. So uh, tighter regulation and surveillance of people um, and a heightened um, sense of and, and awareness and fear of these sort of growing risks in our society. Um, OK, so um, got 20 minutes left. So uh, we're just going to do, yeah, the sort of case study part. So how this I'm going to give you some examples of sort of waste um, and risk, if you like. So um, we are all um, sort of hyper aware of the impact that modern um, uh, manufacturing or modern capitalism has on the global environment. Um, and that has brought, been brought to our attention mainly through sort of scientific study. Um, and last week we spoke about these planetary boundaries. I'll just sort of recap on these um, here. Um, so the planetary boundaries um, is uh, um, they're, they're sort of like nine categories um, and they're nine ways of measuring the harm that humans have caused to the global uh, ecosystem. So our, our planet, nine ways that our planet uh, has been affected by um, um, manufacturing or, or things that humans do, human culture. Um, so the first way uh, is freshwater usage um, is being affected, um, nitrogen flows have been affected, um, ocean acidification is another impact, uh, biodiversity integ integrity is being impacted by human activity, uh, climate change, um, ozone depletion, um, aerosol loading, so sort of aerosol sprays uh, having an effect on um, the, the atmosphere. Um, and then land use change, so the growth and expansion of cities or, or farms. Um, and the last one we're looking at is uh, sort of pollution, number nine, or novel entities, new, uh, new things that have entered uh, the atmosphere or, or um, the surface of, of, of the globe. Um, yeah, in 2009, these uh, scientists estimated that three of these planetary boundaries have been sort of broken or breached um, and were incredibly worried about it. Nevertheless, they did sort of conclude um, that if we can continue to study these planetary boundaries, there could still be a safe space for humans to um, maintain business and, and continue to de develop and sustain life um, human life on the planet safely um, however um, well not how, however a sort of continuation of that study um, in uh, I think this is 2000 and um, more recently I think actually this, is, this could be 2020 um, they've done a sort they every year they go back and they re-study these um, planetary boundaries so this is ongoing research 
um, and this was a more recent sort of up-to-date chart um, and what this chart suggests is that novel entities or new things has inc increased uh, worryingly and significantly um, so new things have been um, unnatural new manufactured things have been uh, released and um, um, yeah released into the, the atmosphere um, so and pollution as a result is sort of out of control uh, so for the first time uh, an international team of researchers has assessed the impact on the sustainability of the earth system of the cocktail of synthetic chemicals and other novel ent uh, entities uh, flooding the environment the 14 scientists uh, conclude in the scientific journal environmental science and technology that humanity has exceeded the planetary boundary related to environmental pollutants, uh, including plastics. There have been a 500 fold increase in the production of chemicals since the 1950s. Uh, this is projected to triple again by 2050, as uh, says co author Patricia. I'm not going to attempt to read that surname uh, from the Stockholm Resilience Center. Um, so plastic production alone uh, increased 79% between 2000 and 2015, the team reports. Um, yeah, so there's quite sort of worrying information, if you like, um, of the risks of um, um, uh, modern production methods, uh, modern culture and modern capitalism on the, on the global environment. Um, yeah, and you know, this is quite, uh, I've shown this in a number of seminars, this, uh, this image, and I find this sort of quite worrying, quite upsetting, you know, this idea that pollutants or plastics are um, being pumped into um, the sea um, and um, that's sort of affecting whales and other wildlife uh, that swim in, in, in the waters of the sea. Um, so the pace that societies are producing and releasing new chemicals and no other novel entities into the environment is not consistent with staying within a safe offering a, a safe operating space for humanity um, is sort of conclusion that they make. Um, now there is sort of international law um, out there that governs uh, the distribution um, and disposal of waste. Um, so it is sort of legal by law um, to pump waste into the environment by international law. Um, I'm not going to go into the detail of the law, um, the links here for you. Um, however, I will say, um, you know, if you, if you look at the news reports currently in Ukraine, um, it's horrific sort of treatment of uh, human beings um, by one country against another. Um, but what we're rarely sort of... Um, um, what is rarely reported in the news is the actual sort of environmental impact um, that this war is having in Ukraine and perhaps in, in Europe. Um, so, you know, often you see sort of plumes of smoke bellowing out from um, oil reserves that have been attacked or tanks that have been blown up. Um, and all of this is going to have some sort of effect on, on the environment in, in that local area. Um, and the reason I'm offering that as a uh, as an example is it sort of, it really demonstrates how easy it is for people um, to ignore international law on environmental um, um, pollution, if you like, um, as well as it is uh, for people uh, to unfortunately ignore the law um, about the treatment of other human beings or animals. Um, so, you know, these laws are out there, um, but um, they're very hard to govern, especially considering, you know, how large and big the world is. Um, but yeah, the, if you're interested in the subject and you want to learn more about the law, uh, there's a sort of link here to the United Nations Environment Programme, um, <clears throat> who are sort of, you know, uh, key to development of international law about waste. Um, Okay, Biffa uh, was the UK's largest waste company. Um, in 2021, um, this company was fined 1.5 million after exporting filthy rubbish uh, marked as waste paper for recycling in India and Indonesia. Uh, prosecution was brought by the UK government's environmental agency. 
Um, 1,000 tons or uh, 50,000 tins, 40,000 plastic bags and 25,000 uh, items of clothing, 3,000 nappies and even a frying pan, condoms and a souvenir New York t-shirt are all among the items packaged as waste paper uh, for export to Asia. Um, so this, there will be lots of examples out there um, and I'm using this as uh, one example of how environmental law um, enables the sort of pros prosecution, national and environmental law, um, uh, international environmental law um, enables the prosecution of the um, 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 uh, inappropriate disposal of, of an illegal disposaling uh, disposal of waste. So that's a good sort of case study. Um, and what we spoke about when we went on the farm visit is this phenomena of fly tipping. Um, so this is another sort of um, example of how waste can be uh, disposed of uh, either legally or illegally. Uh, fly tipping is defined as the illegal deposit of any waste into land that does not have a license to accept it. Um, so there's some more information on Keep Britain Tidy um, about that law. Um, in local, yeah, 2021, uh, local authorities in England dealt with uh, 1.3 million uh, fly tipping incidents uh, and an increase in 16% um since uh, 2019 to 2020 um you'll see here what quite interestingly that um commercial in, industrial estates on this chart um receive relatively low amounts of uh, fly tipping problems private residential areas it's not a common problem um however um back alleyways council land um bridleways and sort of areas close to highways um, is where fly tipping is more likely to occur. Um, yeah, there's some statistic on there. We're running out of time, but um, if you, yeah, actually, we're not running out of time. I'll just, <laughs> the most common uh, size category uh, for fly tipping incidents uh, was equivalent to a small van load, 34% uh, of total incidents, followed by the equivalent of a car boot or less. Um, yeah, so as my dad sort of explained during the, the seminar groups, you know, this is people sort of driving out into the countryside, not wanting to pay or not wanting to um, um, go through the hassle of going down to the local tump, dump and conveniently just tipping it into the, the countryside for someone else to worry about. Um, fly tipping is... Def oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. And... Um, what one sort of thing that can be used to tackle this problem fly tipping is social media um so there's baines council here bath and north uh northeast somerset uh, council um and on their uh a twitter page you can sort of take a photograph and tweet it to um, baines council and they'll get uh, local people uh, local council workers to come and sort of clear up the mess uh, apparently they're quite effect efficient in doing that because of social media and they can make a take a much more sort of targeted approach to um, tackling this problem of uh, fly tipping um, and often fly tippers um, you know dump a lot of envelopes with their names and addresses on uh, which is one way of sort of uh, catching and, and tackling them so sort of name and shame them as well that's another sort of tactic people use um, on social media um, yeah and no, I guess a, um, a, another sort of thing to do with sort of waste um, this isn't to do with fly tipping uh, it's just more generally um, is you know eat, eating up all your all your food you know don't be wasteful you know when you when you should finish your food which is at the end of the sort of production cycle um you know you'll have wrapping and plastics that can be used you know put those in the recycling bin but at the same time you know uh, make use of all the food that's being produced um, and don't um uh, waste your food you know it's a uh, one way in which uh, people can come together sort of tackle the problem of global waste um yeah you might think to yourself you know to what extent are you being a green criminal criminal if you don't eat all your greens um yeah so to end on a sort of um optimistic note um I, you know global problems with, with the environment can uh, be 
you know, concerning, very much so. Um, sometimes it seems like there's not much hope out there, uh, but it's not all doom gloom. Um, there are sort of environmental sociologists um, who speak about a new era of ecological modernization. Um, and this um, suggests that modern culture can develop um, and grow safely within the sort of um, the safe space defined by these planetary boundaries. And circular economies can be established through methods such as um, smart technologies that regulate, monitor and watch the, um, the countryside or, um, the, or, or production processes to make sure that things are highly efficient. Um, there's methods of reducing waste, um, recycling materials and waste. Um, so, you know, do your recycling. Um, upcycling as well, it's, all, it's quite a thing for people to do nowadays. Take furniture um, off of Gumtree, which sometimes is put on there for free. Um, sort of give it a lick of paint or sand it down um, and then resell it. Um, and, you know, a lot of sort of retro furniture um, is quite um, desirable. But today um, in Bristol on Park Street, um, pretty much Park Street is dominated by uh, secondhand clothes shops, um, which is quite exciting to see sort of students um, buying formerly worn um, clothes items as a, as a form of sort of uh, recycling. And lastly, the sort of development of sustainable materials. I think this is key for sort of uh, future economies. So I've got an example here of some night trainers that are made of uh, sustainable materials. Um, and Nike sell trainers, lots of trainers that aren't made from sustainable materials. However, in a way, it's kind of good that they've got this new range of sustainable products. And hopefully in the future, um, perhaps through international law, um, it might be the case that companies like Nike will be encouraged um, and to some extent forced uh, to make new products using recycled materials. And that way, a circular economy could be achieved. Um, so hopefully that's a hot, optimistic point uh, to finish on. So in conclusion, um, green crime, uh, we can define uh, yeah, green crime as acts that cause or have the potential to cause harm to ecological systems for the purpose of increasing um, or supporting production. Uh, another conclusion we can uh, conclude is that capitalism ge generates profits and waste. Um, don't worry about these conclusions on rationalization. I've took those out. Um, within consumer societies, uh, we are all uh, to some extent complicit in the generation of waste and pollution and perhaps um, uh, green crime. Um, but within the UK, waste can be um, exported either legally or illegally and recycled legally or dumped illegally and legally. Um, but a shift towards a circular economy may help save the planet and a new law, new environmental law uh, may help with this transition. Um, uh, this should be genuine, not just greenwashing. You know, we sort of need this change to occur. Um, so to conclude, humans exploit uh, nature for profit and gain and can possibly continue to do so um, if the government's uh, policymakers and lawmakers help uh, to encourage a shift towards the circular, sustainable economies. Whew. OK, so that's the, that's the end of the session. Sorry, it was close to a bang on an hour. Um, hopefully you're still awake. Um, if you've got any questions, um, please um, type them in the comments box. Um, if you're happy with what you've heard, um, and yeah, give me a thank you, give me a thumbs up. I hope you've all found that beneficial. Uh, great, nice to see you all. Have a wonderful day, and remember to eat your greens. <laughs>